One second, the slides are not moving. Okay, so we start with a, a typical baby that comes to mo most of our ICUs. Uh, this is a 38 week cut. It was one of the twins delivered uh, for a G3P2A2 mother through meconium strain like the birth weight was 2.2 kilos. Baby didn't cry immediately at birth and oral and nasal suctioning was done and baby was started on food oxygen. Abgar scores were not known. Baby is born in a smaller nursing home. At two hours of age, shifted to a pri one private hospital and started there on CPAP. In view of progressive tachypnea and desaturation, baby was intubated, shifted to SIMV mechanical ventilation at six hours of age. 2D echo showed a 2 mm PDA and severe pH at that hospital. Baby was started on IV sildenafil and in view of hypotension, started on dopamine. Baby was shifted to our hospital on day two in view of progressively increasing ventilator parameters. And we were on these settings at that time, which was 25 by 7, a rate of 50, and in 90% FIO2. And saturations were in the range of 80s, low 80s to 85%. So before we go forward, I think last few lectures, all of you have been listening to lessons that you have learned from conventional ventilation. Um, and conventional ventilation has helped us a, a lot. And like Dr. Rajesh said, most of the time, we do use conventional ventilation only. But at the same time, we have to remember that there are some issues with this that we face, which is uh, what are the different traumas that we face with this? All of you all know that we face barotrauma because of high pressures, volume trauma because of the volume, effect of the volume. Atelectrotrauma because of uh, of atelectasis itself and biotrauma because of the inflammatory mediators that are secreted when a child is on a ventilator. And all of this together, we call them as ventilator-induced lung injury. And this adds on to all the other factors that are causing um, chronic lung disease. So uh, what actually happens when we use a regular ventilator? So this is a very, very old experiment in 1998, which was done on rat lungs. And as you can see here, this is a normal lung, well-ventilated, perfused, looking pink. Then when conventional ventilation was applied, in those days, there were a lot of times when zero peep was applied or low peep was applied. You see, as, the, uh, as you apply a peep, as you increase your PIP to 45, there are areas of damage that are beginning to develop. The lung is also looking a little less perfused now. And as we increase that for 20 minutes, a lot of the lung is damaged. And many of the times this damage is for good, like we see in children with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Again, this is the uh, cytokines that are released. This is just a quick summary to see that all of these TNF, IL, interleukins, interferons, all of these are increased when there are high volumes used with low peeps. So it's very important to remember that whenever we deliver a PIP or we're delivering volume uh, control ventilation, we have to be very uh, careful about the volume we set and the pressures we set because we are also causing damage at the level of the inflammatory cytokines as well. This study uh, was a major study uh, that happened in the early 2000 and late 1900s that uh, we found that volume for sure, low volume surely improved survival. Now we are also moving more and more in neonatal ventilation also to do volume guarantee and volume control ventilation. It is important to understand and this concept is probably covered over the previous lectures, but I'll go over it quickly that what we want to focus on is an open lung concept. What is an open lung concept? So as you know, this is your uh, hysteris, lung hysteresis curve. And as you increase the pressure, initially the pressure is plateauing in the beginning and it reaches a inflection point. And at that inflection point, the pressure starts increasing to deliver the volume that you want to deliver. 
if you increase the pressure too much, you get less volume increase, but you get beaking. So the optimal recruitment is in this phase where you are here, where you are using less pressures, but getting better volume. So you can see here, I'm getting a volume of around this level and I'm using a pressure of um, a pressure at this level. But if I now can ventilate the same child with a lower pressure on the expiratory curve, this is the inspiratory curve and this is the expiratory curve. If I can ventilate the child at this level, I will be using much lesser volume pressures to get the same volume. So I show it to you here. So like I mentioned, I'm getting this tidal volume Y that I want to get. On the inspiratory curve, I have to be having so much pressure of X. Okay, so this is theoretical. So roughly, if I'm using a pressure of 25, I'm getting here. But if I use a right peep, then and I keep my lung open, my lung is uh, then ventilated on the expiratory curve and I need lesser pressure. So this is the concept of keeping the lung open. And the same concept you can see here, which is represented by CT scan done at different parts of the inflection curve. And if you can see here, the most well ventilated is up here in the expiratory curve. So why are we talking all this? Because we are trying to look at how high frequency ventilation is different. So here again, you can see when you optimize the lung volumes, you can get much better lung, which is opened up and much lesser damage. So what are the lessons that we have learned from conventional ventilation? That prolonged positive pressure ventilation can cause ventilator-induced lung injury. High tidal volume is injurious to the lungs. Ventilate with lower tidal volumes and use optimal MAP. So the concept here that we follow is open the lung and try and keep it open. Now this baby coming back to our case, Activity was poor on admission. Heart rate was 170 to 180 per minute. Peripheral pulses were poorly felt. The uh, blood pressure was borderline. This child was on SIMB, as I mentioned before. And the first gas that we got had a pH of 6.9 with a CO2 of 102. Oxygenation of 58. Bicarb of 12.7. Base is of 16.4. And lactate was 2.28. So, this baby now was very, very sick, okay? And this pH is extremely dangerous. And uh, therefore, here we had to look at both our carbon dioxide uh, elimination and our oxygenation. Baby was given two NS boluses for the blood pressure. Baby was already on dopamine that was increased to 10 mics per kilo per minute. And subsequently, adrenaline was also increased. The and, uh, child was already on sildenafil, so we continued that. So this was the initial x-ray. So the questions that were coming in our mind now is that we have to probably get ready with nitric oxide. We have to get ready with high frequency. So normally what happens when we get a transport call like this, we keep a high frequency ventilator and the nitric oxide machine ready. So this time we have to think, can HFO be an option at this time? So what does HFO exactly do? So uh, what is high frequency ventilation? It is basically CPAP because it gives a regular map, it, which you can call it, as, call it as continuous positive airway pressure with wobbles, okay? So um, what it uh, causes is a sustained inflation. And therefore, because it's sustained, we have this open lung concept, which gets satisfied. And with the wobbles, we get removal of carbon dioxide. And thankfully, both of them don't work. Uh, they don't overlap. They work independently, except at the extremes of the setting. When did this idea come about? So it started with this uh, gentleman, actually an anesthetist, who was observing panting dogs. And he, when he was walking his dog, he found that the dog was breathing so fast. Like, I, for example, I'll just show you this video. You can see how this dog is panting after a run so and but still is able to ventilate itself and it's not uh, becoming blue every time the uh, the dog is breathing right so obviously there is adequate gas exchange even though 
it is through very very small tidal volume so what is exactly high frequency ventilation it is a sustained lung inflation giving very small tidal volumes less than dead space at supra physiological respiratory rates of up to 600 to 900 per minute so here you can see what happens during conventional there is an inspiration that happens and during expiration there is a big change in the volume of the lung due to the pressure now here in high frequency ventilation as you can see the pressure is sustained so there is not that much shear and stress and strain injury that occurs how is the uh, graphic model of the high frequency typically what happens is this is the diaphragm which is oscillating you have an inspiratory bias flow that is coming in and through this valve which is the gas outflow valve this regulates how much the pressure is maintained inside the lung so this is what helps to maintain the map and the oscillator uh, delta p and frequency come from the piston so what are the parameters that you will use to adjust settings on high frequency so typically you would uh, have these knobs one is map then you will have delta p or amplitude frequency on some ventilators it will be called rate inspiratory time which we do not really handle too much we keep it fixed generally at 33% fio2 and bias and now we have different knobs on based on which ventilator we are using so if you are using sensor medics they have different knobs to set these set the map and the bias flow and the sle has much more user friendly um setting so um, as you can see here the map is maintained throughout the cycle and the gas moves at this speed with an amplitude uh, around this map okay so we'll see how the mechanism is there are a lot of theoretical um assumptions on how this is working uh, obviously scientifically it's difficult to prove which of these are the important mechanisms so for oxygenation on uh, uh, hfov from what i've told you so far what do you think are the um, main settings that you will need to adjust you can put your answers here can you all hear me yes yes okay what are the settings that you will need to change for oxygenation students can um, just put in your answers here it could be right wrong we'll clarify that along the way no answers yet map very good and fio2 excellent so um for oxygenation here in hfov what we really need to work on is the map and fio2 so it becomes easy because whereas in conventional ventilation you have to think of the peep you have to think of the pip the i time here all you have to do is take care of the fio2 and the map setting so carbon dioxide any guesses i think some of you all must be already using it so for carbon dioxide elimination which are the settings you will have to change okay so unlike you have a little a few new settings here unlike in conventional ventilation amplitude and frequency okay so we will discuss about the details on how it works now the different mechanisms of gas exchange because you wonder that you are giving uh, tidal volumes which are less than dead space or almost equal to dead space volume and how come we are getting gas exchange so these are some of the theories that have been postulated one is the bulk flow which is same as uh, conventional ventilation which is your bulk gas flow that enters into your airways and then it goes into your alveolar there is another mechanism called as pent buildup then there is a an important mechanism called as asymmetric velocity profile so we'll discuss a few of them as we go along 
Then there is Taylor type dispersion, which helps mainly in carbon dioxide removal. Because remember, when these tiny volumes are going in, you also want the carbon dioxide to be going out at the same time. So how does that work? And collateral ventilation. And as you can see in this picture, they have tried to show how these things work. The gas is turbulent because of the oscillation. So there's turbulent gas coming in. There is asymmetric profiles, as in the central jet is going at a different, different speed from the jets which are on the side of this curve. Then the same velocity profile you will get during expiration. At some places, there is laminar flow. Some places you have turbulent flow going on into the smaller uh, bronchi. You have pendulum mechanism by which, uh, like a pendulum, the air flows between the alveoli. And also this collateral ventilation through tiny connections between the alveoli also happening during high frequency ventilation. Some of these mechanisms we'll see. For the proximal gas exchange units, the bulk convention that I mentioned is the main way it will flow. So there are some bronchi which take off very early from the right main bronchus and the left uh, main bronchus. So those will get direct flow by this bulk gas flow. Then coming to the asymmetric velocity profiles, as I explained, the central particles get propelled along the length of this airway. And what actually happens is there is also an axial, which is like going around gas exchange of expired gas volume. So with the two of this, you get oxygenation and then you get carbon dioxide elimination as well. This is again a very important mechanism called Taylor dispersion. In fact, some of the studies say that this is one of the main mechanisms by which it works, which is a radial transport and longitudinal dispersion that happens at the same time. And during this, carbon dioxide elimination happens, and which is why carbon dioxide elimination becomes such an effective uh, elimination in case of high frequency. This does not happen in conventional. Even if you go from a rate of 30 to 60, you do not get the same rate of decrease in carbon dioxide that you get when you set the amplitude at 40 or 50 on a high frequency ventilator. So this mechanism, the Taylor dispersion, where there are eddy currents, as you can see here, gas is entering into the lung and that is flowing through this main jet. And around this, as you can see, you can see it's going in a twisted manner. What's going out is the carbon dioxide. And therefore, carbon dioxide elimination is not getting affected by the air that is flowing in. That is why the constant map does not affect the uh, carbon dioxide elimination. I hope you all have understood this. I just spend a little more time on this because this is a little confusing. So just going over it again, a central jet going in, which helps in the oxygenation. And around it, the gas swirls around it. And that helps in the elimination of carbon dioxide. Pendulous mechanism, we already just mentioned. What happens is there are some fast lung units and small, slower lung units with greater time constants. And this happens a lot in meconium aspiration. As you have varying time constants in uh, meconium aspiration based on where you have meconium deposited and in some you have air trapping. So based on that, these this equi equalizes the air between the two units. So as you can see here, the air comes in and there is a small, uh, a slower unit and a fast unit. And as you can see, the air comes in here and then it equalizes, it gets time because the next air that is coming in takes time. As they oscillate slowly as dead space volumes over here, there is time for this shift to happen between alveoli. So you will still have to go back and read what I'm telling because in the theory, when you read up these theories in detail, you will understand it much better. But I've just given you an exposure to what it is. So the important thing that happens in high frequency is there is decoupling of the oxygenation and carbon dioxide elimination. So these curves show you the same thing here that as you have set the map, the oxygenation is improving, but that does not affect your uh, carbon dioxide elimination. So the, you can use, uh, like I said, the knobs are completely different for the both of them and they don't interfere with each other on HFO. That is one basic difference. Now coming to the map, 
So what typically happens is due to attenuation of a uh, pressure wave, by the time it reaches the alveolar region, it is cut down to around 2 centimeters of water. So you might be giving a map of 20, 25, but that is not what the alveoli will see. It will see a map much lesser than that because as it travels through the airways, the alveoli actually sees much lesser pressures. So uh, in HFO, you do not get this, you know, sudden expansion and then coming down to the peep level. And therefore, you do not get as much injury. Today, I think some of you all must have heard of something called as ergotrauma. And that is caused because of the strain and stress that is induced, uh, uh, caused on the alveoli during the shear and stress effects of PIP and PEEP, which does not happen as you can see here. The mean airway pressure is continuously maintained. So the alveoli are almost at the same size throughout the cycles of respiration. Now, uh, also at the cellular level, there is um, uh, injury that can be seen when we use high frequency because we are using uh, the same pressure throughout. As you can see here, there's not much of inflammatory cytokines here and the alveoli are all, almost the same sizes. Whereas a lung biopsy of a conventional me mechanical ventilation um, animal is you can see here there's lots of neutrophils and a lot of cells that have been have come into this interstitium and the alveoli are also battered. You know, the shape has changed. They have been so these are things that have been proven uh, on animal model. Okay. So well, how can we then use this high frequency ventilators and what types of high frequency ventilators are there? So there are a lot of studies even on high frequency jet ventilation, but most of us use high frequency oscillatory ventilation, which is the first one which I've mentioned. There is also high frequency flow interrupter. And now you have also high frequency positive pressure ventilation on some ventilators, including there are studies with nasal high frequency ventilation. So how do you start? Now we know there are a lot of um, good things that we know about high, high frequency ventilation. So let, we need to know how do we start with setting high frequency. So basically, before HFOV, there are some things that always have to be done. You have to have com continuous monitoring. So first thing is to have continuous monitoring so that you can also have of both blood pressure and blood gases. Therefore, it's better to have an arterial line have a good central line access as well. Why do you have to have a good central line access when you are starting um, um, this high frequency ventilation? Anyone wants to try? Why? Why a good CVL access will be good, whether it's a central line, umbilical line, big line? Any guesses? Come on, students. We must interact. You think we can manage on peripheral uh, line as well, or we would need a central line? So the reason we need a central line is because we would need uh, very, very close uh, monitoring of one is the BP with the art line so that we can use inotropes. So many of the times these kids would need inotropes as well. Um, the airway placement has to be perfect because you do not want to keep adjusting the endotracheal tube after you put the child on high frequency. So uh, verify the ET placement by X-ray uh, as well and then if you are using cuff tubes uh, you you can use cuff tubes as well because we can use that sometimes when we get uh, very high carbon dioxide level we can deflate the cuff um, sedation it's better to initially start um, with good sedation later on the babies get actually quite comfortable so you can bring down your sedation level you can use fentanyl morphine and also you can use uh, muscle relaxation in the beginning 
and usually i don't do it beyond the first one or two hours so once the baby settled the gases have come in the normal range we should not muscle relax these babies they do not need it um now before you start you also keep uh, a saline bolus ready sometimes what happens is when you are starting high frequency ventilation suddenly the pressure is going to go up the mean airway pressure is going to be maintained like i mentioned at a uh, we maintain it at a higher level than the conventional ventilation so initially you might have a drop in venous return and need volume so for example for map settings there are two volume strategies that are used you use a high volume strategy and where you are worried about air leaks like cases like meconium aspiration or uh, cdh where you have hypoplastic lungs you use a low volume strategy in that you start with 3 to 5 cm of water uh, above the uh, conventional ventilation if your conventional ventilation map is around 12 you would start it around 14 or 15 in the air leak strategy you would go only one or two higher usually i i almost start with the same map as the conventional and then if needed increase it after the initial setting the map is slowly increased till you can get your fi out over time not uh, immediately over times as you monitor it against the saturation so you slowly increase the map and then you confirm that you are using the right map by x ray because there is no other real way of confirming that on high frequency you will have to get an x ray and see how many spaces you have so you should have up to 8 spaces 8 to 9 spaces which is good nothing more than that because if you over inflate the lung again you lose the benefit so at extremes map and uh, amplitude delta p all of these can be detrimental so this picture i already showed you before i just want to show you here in the ct scan when you use very high map you start getting all this air trapping and potential air leak happening if you use very high map so it's important to start um like i mentioned with the setting 3 to 5 above uh, you can even start to keep it uniform and start at 2 above the uh, conventional mechanical ventilator and then go up based on your x ray and your uh, saturation so to improve oxygenation i mentioned uh, you need to slowly increase the map until x ray shows uh, good inflation and sometimes in older children we use maneuvers like recruitment recruitment maneuvers i don't really use this at all in newborn babies how do you select the amplitude so amplitude is simple to uh, set you need to set it at such a level where you get the wiggle or it's called wobble also is visible uh, up to the abdomen okay abdomen to the upper thigh is ideal and you can adjust this uh, in increments of 3 to 5 till you get a proper wiggle wiggle is what do i mean by wiggle like the video i showed you of the dog panting you have to see the um, chest moving in that way so the chest has to be oscillating and we call that a wiggle and then you would follow this uh, setting by looking at the uh, blood gases to see if the carbon dioxide is maintained so the delta p roughly when you start off you started around 30 to 40 in a term baby and around 20 in a preterm for the frequency it is something that you really don't touch too much so usually for a term baby you keep the frequency at 10 and for a preterm baby you would start it a little higher one thing you have to remember about amplitude is when you increase the amplitude the carbon dioxide will come down and when you decrease the amplitude the carbon dioxide will go up like the rate in the conventional ventilator so this amplitude works uh, like the rate on the conventional ventilation ventilator but frequency or rate on the uh, high frequency ventilator actually works the other way so if you increase frequency the co2 will go up if you decrease frequency your co2 will come down okay so this goes in the same direction the free, uh, in frequency it goes in the same direction in amplitude it goes in opposite direction you can see that here how lower frequencies have a larger volume displacement and therefore it improves the carbon dioxide emission now the other settings that we really don't like i mentioned 
set it once and then don't change it too much is the bias flow. So on the sensor medics, this setting is uh, there and we can go up to 20, uh, up to 15 to 20 in a neonate and in older children, we go up to even 30 to 40 and adults up to 60 liters per minute. Inspiratory time is generally kept at 33% and it's kept static at that same level. FiO2 usually based on the saturation. So most of these sick children, you directly start at one or 100% and then you bring it down or you go 10% to 20% above the conventional ventilator. Now, which are the ventilators that effectively order uh, offer us um, high frequency? One is the SLE Draeger. Uh, it does a very good job up to the uh, weight of 10 kilos. Uh, similarly, the new BN500 and the old, our old sensor medics, I think ventilator, high frequency ventilation really started with this machine. And this is what I used the most, both in neonates, in uh, pediatrics, and uh, also introduced the same in the cardiac ICU in our hospital. Um, so the display panels in these are different. So as you can see here, um, you have on the SLE, you have these settings, which is the IE ratio, the rate, Rate is the same as frequency. You have the mean airway pressure. Then you have delta P, which is the amplitude. And then you have F FiO2. And on sensor medics, you have the map over here. Stored over here. There are alarm limits that are set over here. Um, this is your amplitude, or it's called power on the sensor medics. You have the I time, as I mentioned, kept at 33%. And this is the rate, which is 6 in this case. You have these knobs, this black knob is for the flow, and this green knob also adjusts the settings of the map. So in our case, we shifted this child to HFOV uh, with a FiO2 of around 80% at that time with a frequency of nine and a map of 16. Delta P was 40. After sending investigations, um, the child was also started on IV adrenaline at that time. The echo showed us Suprasystemic pulmonary pressure, which was expected uh, with a TR gradient of 50. And um, so we, at this time, we also started inhaled nitric oxide. And I think that is being covered in another uh, talk on Monday. We also started supportive treatment, which we do for all these kids, which is minimal light and sound, minimal handling, cluster care, normal calcium and glucose was maintained. And... Um, the blood pressures were maintained normal uh, with adrenaline and dopamine. So um, here also the targets that we were maintaining because it's a case of PPHN is a pH of 7.4 to 7.5. PO2 is in the range of 80, at least 70 and above. P PCO2 is 35 to 45. Post HFOV, after an hour, we had an ABG which uh, had improved, but it was 7.21 with its carbon dioxide of 70. And the PO2 was 154, bicarb was 17. So the settings were further adjusted. Uh, any idea what settings we would have adjusted? Based on this gas, what do you think we would have needed to adjust? So we needed to adjust both amplitude. Yes. So normally we don't adjust the frequency initially. What you can do is increase amplitude, not decrease amplitude. We will have to increase. Like I said, when we increase amplitude, carbon dioxide will come down. So here we want our carbon dioxide to come down. Uh, the frequency we would use uh, only if we are stuck with the highest amplitude. So you can go up on the amplitude up to 70 to 80. Beyond 70 and 80, it does not work very well. So at that level, we can start bringing the frequency down. Um, now, again, PO2, we are all very happy. So I wouldn't touch the map. In fact, I will reduce the FiO2 at this level. So two hours later, we had then a pH, which had... So this is something that happens with h 4 So we went from a CO2 of 70 to 30. This can happen very quickly. So that is why when you increase the delta P, it's always better to do a gas within an hour. Here we had done a gas two hours later. We should have done this probably within an hour because the CO2 had already gone down to 30. 
So that was a very quick improvement that happened after the first gas. So at this point, we had reached a delta P of 25, frequency was 9, FiO2 was 50%, and MAP we could reduce to 13. And inhaled nitric was continued at 20 ppm. So this is typically how the unit looks like at that time, is that you have a high frequency machine here, the nitric going on here. And we shut the curtains and all that so that it is kind of dark for the baby. On day four of the uh, admission, baby was then shifted. Actually, we came to minimal settings and so baby was shifted to SIMV, conventional ventilation, with a FIO2 of 30%. Now, the question on what settings do you shift this child from high frequency to conventional? So, basically, when you come to a map of around 10 to 12, <coughs> and when you come to an FIO2 of less than 40%, and you are at a delta P of less than 20 you can at this point shift to conventional ventilation. Now, there are some units which will, and I worked in some units like that in Sydney, which would directly take the child, extubate the kid from high frequency ventilator, which also can be done. Um, and uh, for that, but you know, many times for comfort purposes also we shift to um, conventional first and then uh, extubate, but you can also directly extubate. Uh, in this child, the, as you can see, the gas is improved. Adrenaline could be tapered off. IV sildenafil also was continued for another five to seven days, and then that was tapered off. 2D echo improved. The TR gradient had come down to 25, and the biventricular function has improved. So now coming to a quick monitoring that we need to do on HFOV. First, like I mentioned, vitals, BP, um, the perfusion, all, all the time we have to watch this because Intrathoracic pressure is going up, venous return will come down, and the child may need fluids, child may need uh, inotrope. So you have to keep that ready. Test movements have to be watched constantly. If you lose your wobbles, remember, generally when you're on high frequency and you can't see the wobbles and suddenly you start seeing the child breathing, it's because there is some blockage in the airway. So this blockage can be in the endotracheal tube or it, it could be even in the lower part of the trachea and the bronchi. So these children will need good suction. So remember that uh, you can use closed suction, but sometimes with closed suction, uh, all the plugs do not get uh, removed. So you may need to do open suction in these cases occasionally. Um, it is very important to do chest um, auscultation because you need to know the actual intensity of the sound. So you can do chest auscultation on HFO. And when you take the child for suctioning, at that time you can actually auscultate the child for listening to the air entry uh, like we normally do. ABGs generally are done four to six hourly when on the HFO. X-ray is done in the first hour after initiation and subsequent to that, you can do it eight to 12 hourly also. And uh, once the child is on the high frequency on stable settings, you can do it once a day. So X-ray can go from this to this very, very quickly. Okay, so we have to be ex extremely careful when we start uh, high frequency in this child you can see how suddenly we have completely opened up the lung and in small in preterms this happens very often so an x-ray is extremely important uh, this was a severe uh, rds going into um, you know completely over inflated lungs so wobbles you reassess uh, like i mentioned if chest oscillation is diminished uh, just check if the ETT is obstructed or disconnected. If the chest oscillation is unilateral, you have to remember you could have a pneumothorax, which is which was very common in earlier days when the babies were put on high frequency. Today we know the machines much better, so we do hardly get any pneumothoraces in our baby. How do you wean these babies? You um, wean them when, of course, there is resolution of the pathology. So if it's getting worse on X-ray. If the baby is getting sicker, you don't wean them. FiO2, once it comes less than 60%, you can start weaning. You wean MAP up to 10 to 12, as I mentioned. Wean amplitude to the range of 20. And you should have stable gases. Then you can wean this child. Some of the risks. So if you ask me what really I have faced, there are two, three things that I have faced with um, HFO. One is that HFO is not working for a particular kid. This can happen. Uh, that you put the baby on HFO and the baby actually worsens pretty badly, you may have to quickly come back to conventional. So for some babies, it may just not work. 
you might have selected the wrong type of case uh, to go on high frequency. So uh, if you are using this without recruiting the lung properly on conventional, you won't get any extra benefit on high frequency ventilator. So if you have not recruited the lung well, uh, it becomes an issue even for the nitric oxide to work. So important to recruit the lung adequately on conventional. And if it's not, then only going on to um, uh, high frequency ventilator. Earlier on, Dr. Rajesh was just mentioning that there is only one situation where we electively put them um, on high frequency and that is in congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So if I have a baby coming with CDH, then I directly put them on the low settings of high frequency ventilation. Um, one of the issues, like I said, is hypotension, so be ready for that. It may become a little difficult to deliver aerosolized medication, which is not a big issue in newborn, but in pediatrics, we face that issue. Uh, very important to remember the sudden uh, drop in carbon dioxide can lead to periventricular leukomalacia in the future. So you have to titrate the carbon dioxide very carefully when on high frequency. Contraindications are... Um, earlier, we used to say this was a contraindication, but uh, pneumothorax is, but other air uh, situations where you have overtrapping, you can still use it as long as you use it carefully. But in overt air leak, you would not use um, high frequency ventilation. <clears throat> Again, in shock, you would use HFO after you correct the shock or stabilize the shock. Um, most of the complications are seen due to inexperience. So as you get experience with any tool, you become an expert at that tool. Okay. Before you get experience, you might feel like a fool with a tool. But as you get experience, you start getting better. Uh, so therefore, important to uh, avoid all these things. As time goes by, you'll learn how to do that. We've discussed most of the benefits of HFOV. So I'll just summarize saying that it causes continuous alveolar recruitment at much small tidal volume. So therefore, at least the volume trauma part is taken care of. It preserves the end expiratory lung volume, therefore keeping the lung open. It minimizes the stretch and strain injury or the ergo trauma. It avoids over distension, therefore it prevents barrel trauma. And this is very important therefore to do an X-ray to see this. And therefore overall, um, most of the neonatal studies show us that there may be, especially in small numbers, they have shown us that it reduces the uh, chances of ventilator-induced lung injury. Though the adult trials did not prove this, and they actually stopped using high-frequency ventilator because of more death in the population, in the adult population with high frequency. This was a cardiac baby that we put, and here you can see the settings that are there on uh, HFO. So again, these two we don't really change. This is inspiratory time and the frequency. And these are the two knobs we work on, the delta P and this knob which works on the pressures. Uh, there are very uh, few studies uh, and they all have small number of infants in them. So this is one which looked at elective use of HFO uh, and 19 eligible studies were taken. There were 4,000 infants in this. Um, and uh, this is another, and here what they found is no difference in IBH, no difference in mortality, and increased risk of uh, air leaks was found in this. But And there was a slight decrease in chronic lung disease. Uh, this is another study that uh, is, I, yeah, in 2009, a Cochrane review with 199 infants and two trials. And uh, what they found is that there is no evidence from RCT to suggest that HFO is better than conventional. Uh, and in this, there was only a trend towards better outcomes. Okay, so this is the summary of most of the HFO trials, as you can see. This is the forest plot. Okay, and this is the point estimate that we have for, for each of these studies. So in the first one, which is the HFOV versus low rate conventional mechanical ventilation, they found that HFOV is better. When we use a high rate conventional ventilation, they found their effects were almost the same whether you used HFO or conventional. And overall, it was found that HFO might be slightly better because it's closer to the null line. So I'm calling it slightly better, uh, but it is surely away from the null line. Therefore, this was shown to be overall slightly better incidence, uh, ready in better in reducing the incidence of BPD. So in conclusion, we can say that HFOV is a safe mode 
it can be used in the nicu uh, it can be used occasionally as a primary mode like i said uh, probably in a case of hypoplastic lungs rescue mode most of the time that's what we use when we fail on C conventional ventilation again an important point here is you don't wait to fail on conventional ventilation totally so when you know that you're going on high pressures like you're on a peep of six already um, and your pip has touched uh, 22 25 i think this is the time you start thinking early of hfo so you don't damage the lung so much and then if you don't damage the lung so much you don't need high settings of hfo as well so thinking of hfo earlier helps so an earlier method of rescue not waiting for complete failure of conventional ventilation and it works very effectively with inhaled nitric oxide as i just showed you in this particular case um, it also works as a bridge to ecmo so we use that uh, also in the cardiac unit a lot um, as a bridge before we put the child on ecmo also in the pediatric icu we use it as a bridge to ecmo so i think uh, with that i want to just end with a few practical tips which i've already covered so you all can just read that if any questions, uh, do feel free to ask. I think there was one question that I saw. Why the air leak uh, strategy has lower volumes, uh, lower pressures? Because uh, higher MAP will cause more air leak, right? So therefore, we have um, we will start with lower MAPs when we have uh, air leak kind of syndrome like air trapping um, in older kids bronchiolitis asthma when all these kids you put them on hfo you always start with lower maps same thing with uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia you would start them on lower maps even as low as eight you would start them on that low main airway pressures Rita, one question hmm. uh, frequent uh, et tube obstruction is a little commoner in HFO as compared to your uh, uh, conventional mode of ventilation. Correct. So how do you how do you tackle it? How do you how do you minimize it? So one uh, is that uh, normally what I do is most of my high frequency I put the closed suction. Now, but the issue with this is that uh, in high frequency because see how the tiny uh, volumes are moving in again tiny volumes are moving out. So the little plugs tend to get obstructed in the tube so at least twice a day i do a open suction even if i have connected them to a closed suction then i do an open suction uh, at least twice a day and also because the flow is very high yeah the humidification is not good enough correct because yeah so some so, ventil some ventilators have uh, provision to increase the humidity like yeah. i have sophie sophie has got you can increase the humidity. Okay. So, uh, whenever I put on high frequency with Sophie, I increase the uh, humidity to the maximum. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, the other ventilators like this, SLE and uh, Tensor Medics and all, you don't have that. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You don't uh, have that facility. That, yeah. SL, especially Sensor Medics, we do face okay. that mm -hmm. a lot more than SLE. And other things, many, many of the units do it and that they put in between uh, HFE, they put IMB rates. So right. HFO, mm -hmm. IMB. IMB has a very low rate. Yeah, the combined, the combined uh, one. Uh, uh, HFO plus CMV. That HFO mode is there. HFO yeah. CMV, two yeah. to five rates. Yeah. Two to five rates per minute as a side breath, basically. Mm -hmm. And assumption is that it may recruit the lung first. And second is that tiny bits of secretion we are getting of stuck to the uh, tube, it may clear out, clear it off. Mm. So there are many units I know because I also many times do it to mm. two to three. So eight. somehow I must say that honestly I've not had so much except with the bigger children, no, this blockage. With newborns I've not had a real issue where suctioning is concerned. I don't know is it because of the two times we mm. do the full proper open suctioning. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the time, we do a close suctioning, actually. Mm -hmm. But I like I don't remember any time that we've had an issue with tube block or mm -hmm. anything like that. In newborn, in pediatric ICO, it's a little bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to work quite very stringently on this uh, suctioning on that side. But in ICU, it's not been a big issue for me. 
but like you said these are some uh, strategies can be used uh, to prevent this from happening so those are good ideas as well and also like i learned one thing which i was not practicing that uh, cdh you start okay. straight away with the high frequency i was not yeah. Also, uh, always CDH uh, elected. I mean, the, I must thank the Sick Kids uh, a model which does that, and because of which I started doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, the first thing is the HFO is kept ready always. Oh, oh. nice idea. And uh, yeah, there are two messages. Huh. Why hypotension versus in HFO? There is one question. Yeah. So, like I mentioned earlier, what happens in HFO, um, you are recruiting the alveoli almost in conventional, the alveoli do go from a PIP to a PEEP, right? So, they go from like a 25 to 5 or 6. Okay, so there, there is a change over time. But in uh, HFO, the map is constantly keeping the lungs open at the same level. So, due to this, if you are slightly hype, if the baby is slightly hypovolemic, or baby has other reasons like in PPHN, where they could have cardiogenic reasons for having a low blood pressure, in those situations, the venous return is actually hampered. So your intrathoracic pressure is being maintained constantly at a little higher level than what it would be in conventional. So therefore, the uh, child might have hypotension because of which I said keep volume ready. Usually we connect the syringe and keep so that the minute the blood pressure drops, we can just run the infusion. In okay. meconium aspiration, first we recruit the lung by conventional and if it fails, then we put it on HFOV with lower map. Yeah, you can do that always. You can, the conventional does work if you recruit the, if you can recruit it on a conventional, then good. But don't go on very high settings on conventional. So that, you know, by then you've already caused all this lung injury and the child takes much longer on ventilator than um, whether you do HFO or you do conventional. So doing switching early is also important. Uh, from your talk, it was not very clear that uh, when do you switch to HFO when your pressures are going high? You just told that uh, PP6 and uh, P, uh, PIP 20 to 25. Mm -hmm. it, Many, ah, of, okay. many, when do you, many, yeah. of, many of us practice when your map is going more than 14, 15. Yeah. Be switchable. That yes. Better. So roughly that what it will be. So if your PIP is around 25 and your uh, PIP is 6, so generally your map is around 14 to 15. So if you are steadily going up, one, second, of course, oxygenation index you use. Uh, so people use the oxygenation index going beyond 20. And, and uh, beyond 30, you think of ECMO. So that is the cutoffs that are used for switching. And uh, you come down, you remove, you come down to conventional mode when your uh, uh, map is around 10. Map is 8 to 10. Yeah, 8 to 10. Uh, in a preterm, pre generally even 8 to 10, we can remove. In older kids, uh, term babies, we do 10 to 12 also. So if they are 12 also, you can switch to conventional. But wait for the wobbles uh, also to the delta P also to come down to around 25 to 30. So around 25 is good actually. Mm -hmm. Because a 25 I've seen uh, usually correlates with a rate of 30. It mm -hmm. becomes easy to switch to conventional of 30 at that. Dijon? Uh, Dr. Rajesh, uh, thank you, Dr. Pritha. Uh, any question? So, I think most of the thing has been discussed mm -hmm. about the secretion. Mm -hmm. What we have seen, the regular suction, what she was telling, but if there is, if the oval is good, vibration is okay, there is no need of doing suction frequently. So rather, it will cause every time we do suction, it will, lung will again go to the stage of de-recruitment. De that we want to avoid. Second yeah. important thing is some ventilators are there nowadays. We can use BG along with the high frequency. Mm -hmm. So in that case, amplitude should automatically be adjusted based on the tidal volume. So one to two mm -hmm. ml tidal volume can be recorded like or SLE six thousand or all the ventilator like your servo L. So just like a VG in conventional ventilation, here one to two ml per kg VG is selected and you get you select a maximum 
amplitude. And amplitude will be adjusted based on the volume guarantee. That way, CO2 can be managed very well. And also, DCO2 can be done managed in many ventilators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are also using uh, sensor medics. I have got a machine. But the one of the problem of sensor medic is that it, it is a dedicated high frequency ventilation. You don't have the conventional mode. But in nowadays, the other ventilators, they have got the conventional as well as HOV. So in sensor medics, it is good. It is one of the very good ventilators. But we have to again disconnect the baby and go to the another one ventilator. But now okay. modern ventilators, what they are available, this SLE 6000, Servo N, or even baby lock, uh, the same machine you can switch over. That is one advantage. Yeah. So I think most of the thing has